Angela Ferrari is an artist and children's book author and illustrator who is based in Portland, Maine. She is the creator and host of the Story Spectacular podcast. Angela grew up in the mountains of Western Maine. Living in a rural setting, she developed a talent for finding creative ways to play and captivate her imagination. After graduating with a BA in studio art from the University of Maine, Angela moved to Portland. She was accepted into the Assets for Artists program, which focused on business finance for creative entrepreneurs. After completing the required training, Angela received matching grant funds for working capital. She then became a successful painter. She has since expanded her artistic endeavors, writing and illustrating four children's books, Digger's Daily Routine, An Extraordinary Book, What Do You See, The Shape Escape, and Lawrence the Lighthouse. Angela has also launched Story Spectacular, a children's story podcast, which features original stories and classic retellings. Welcome to the PR Maven podcast, a podcast all about growing your network and building your brand through traditional and digital networking techniques. I'm Nancy Marshall, the PR maven and CEO of Marshall Communications. I've been strengthening brands through PR for over 35 years, and now I'm celebrating the success of executives, influencers, business owners, and entrepreneurs from all around the world, all of whom have cultivated their brands and broadened their networks through traditional and digital networking methods. Each week, I interview one of these interesting and influential individuals and provide an opportunity for you, the PR Maven Nation, to gain insights from their strategies and stories. So stay tuned for this week's episode, and thanks for listening. So Angela, to kick things off, tell me about your career and how you got into it in the first place. Well, um, I'm a children's book author and illustrator, and I also host Story Spectacular, which is a podcast for kids. And how I got started, I went to UMaine for studio art and got my degree there. And then I moved down to Portland and started my career off as a landscape painter. And I've been doing that for the past 12 years. I've had a lot of fun and success with it. But after, you know, painting landscapes, I was like, oh, this is so fun. But I have more creativity to share. I've got some stories I really want to tell. I want to find a way to expand this. So I started dabbling in writing children's books and illustrating and uh, looked into publishing. So that's how I kind of started getting into kids' books. Um, And I, you know, I went to a lot of conferences and met with fellow authors. I met with agents and publishers, and I realized that that traditional process wasn't for me. I have so much energy. I'm a really fast moving person. So I wanted to have a lot more control over my own destiny and my own career. And I decided to self-publish. And when I decided to self-publish, I said, I need to find a really creative way to self-promote, get my name out there as an author. And that's why I started my children's story podcast. I love that. That's awesome because you exemplify exactly what this podcast is about, which is you build your brand and your network both online and in person. Mm -hmm. So you've done a really great job of that. It's It's the most meaningful work I've ever done because it's 360 degrees of creativity. It's writing, illustrating, sound engineering and, you know, telling jokes, meeting with kids in person and like hearing from kids all across the world um, through online means. So it's been the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Not to mention dancing, (laughs) which we may end up doing a little bit of. We were trying to figure out how we can dance on a podcast. (laughs) And of course, Tanner, the audio engineer here is a little worried about laughing because he knows that we're going to have a hard time getting through this when you and I get together. It's a giggle fest. I know. (laughs) 
<laughs> it is, but that's what I love about you is your your love of life. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And we met through the League of Maine Podcasters, right? We that, did. But of course, I knew of the Ferrari family <laughs> from Farmington, Maine. Yep, there's a lot of us around. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. And I think that um, actually my mom went back to University of Maine at Farmington when she was 40 years old, which would have been like in the late 70s. And I think she was in a, a biology class or something with Maybe you're one of your uncles. Okay. Well, Feather Ferrari. Is oh, that? yeah. That's my uncle, Stephen. Yeah, they call him Feather. <laughs> right? I think my mom and Feather were like besties. <laughs> oh, in 19... Maine is a small world. I know. I always say it's good if you're good and bad if you're mm -hmm. bad. But either way, everybody's going to know about mm -hmm. it. <laughs> So yeah, that's a that's a, a tie that we have that I'm not sure you knew about was uh, my mom Martha and Feather. <laughs> <laughs> so if you had it to do all over again, is there anything that you would do differently? Um, I would have hired you at the beginning and focusing focused more on my marketing because. I just didn't have a very open-minded approach to marketing when I started my business. I treated it like a chore. You know, I had a launch plan laid out, but I didn't have a sustained plan because, you know, with marketing, it's an ongoing journey. You always have to be innovative. You always have to be finding a way to, you know, grow and expand your audience. So, you know, I, I focused a lot more on what I was good at, which was content creating, doing the art, doing the stories. And then I came to an epiphany about six months into it that I can be creative in my marketing. It doesn't have to fit this traditional mold. I can be a storyteller in, you know, how I promote Story Spectacular. So I started doing videos, collaborating with um, fellow podcasters, and I started finding ways so my audience could participate with the show and interact even more. So I started having kids come on and tell jokes and do animal noises, and in turn, they they started sharing even more with their audiences too. So I think it's about thinking outside of the box. And that's what I wish I knew sooner. Well, I'm uh, there's so much I want to say. <laughs> like, first of all, you're right on target with uh, content marketing. I mm -hmm. mean, that's the way that marketing is going. But the other thing I want to mention is uh, Roger Lambert is a world champion moose caller from Strong, Maine. Okay. And I, I would love to introduce you because I've actually worked with him promoting moose calling championships. <laughs> like one of the biggest PR successes we've ever had is we got five minutes on National Public Radio of this guy, Roger oh, Lambert, doing a moose call. <laughs> and of course, uh, then one time we had him doing a moose call for the Weather Channel uh, via Skype. And he was warning, he he had this woman meteorologist who like was doing the moose call. And he was like, be careful because you're going to have male moose coming into the studio <laughs> thinking that it's running season. <laughs> but anyway, that is a sideline to, I mean, that's not really what we're here to talk about. I just wanted to say that uh, Roger is somebody. I didn't know that was a thing. So thank you moose for calling. illuminating. Oh, yes. yeah. That's very important. Yeah, for moose hunting, which is moose hunting season now, I think. So. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. For a Franklin County girl, I'm surprised. <laughs> I knew about the turkey calling, but I didn't oh, yeah. know about the moose calling. Oh, I, yeah. I didn't know. Yep. Uh, yeah, we'll have to do that sometime. <laughs> Um, so can you give me a specific example of how you've used social media or PR that to advance your cause and tell your story? Yeah. So um, early on, I connected with fellow podcasters through social media. And I, over the past couple of years, I'm in regular contact with them to the point where I forget that I haven't actually met these people in person because it's it's a very close connection we share um, techniques. We talk a lot of shop, but the big thing I got, I've got, i gotten out of it um, is collaborating and being on each other's shows, writing articles about each other. It would have been so easy for me to look at other children's podcasters as competition and not wanted to work with them. But instead, we've been able to share and grow audiences together and all get better at our craft because we connect with each other. That that is a really effective way to mm -hmm. grow your network is to look at other people's networks and to 
embrace their networks mm-hmm. and to to share your audience or your network with them. So I'm so glad you've done that. And here you are today. <laughs> I'm sharing you with my network too, PR Maven Nation. Hey! <laughs> I'm sure they're going to love <laughs> love hearing about you and they'll all want to meet you too. So um, are there some obstacles that you faced in your career and how have you overcome them? Uh, yeah, the biggest obstacle I have, and I, I don't know if I should even say this, but even like doing podcast interviews, I get the nerve north so bad before I have to speak, before I do live events, any kind of public engagement. Um, you know, it's weird because up until this point, I never was a shy person. I was never uncomfortable in social situations. But when it came to my work, I care so much that I want to come off perfect. And I would just get so nervous, like over prepare and, you know, have these expectations that, of course, you're not going to be able to fulfill. And so I, I've had to overcome that, you know, the these like highs and lows of like putting myself out there in front of people. And the big way, honestly, I've overcome it is um, dancing. Yeah. Yeah. So I even started recently being an instructor at a local neighborhood um, dance studio where I force myself to get up in front of people and teach. And the big thing it's taught me is I can't prepare. I have to adapt. I have to focus on who's in front of me. Are they, you know, dealing with a knee injury or are they high energy or low energy and make sure I'm tailoring my content to fit their needs instead of being so in my head and having my own expectations of how things are supposed to go. So by doing that, I've been able to, you know, approach any live event with a sense of, okay, this isn't nerves. I'm excited. I can do this. I know I can get through it and I can enjoy, I can enjoy being present in the moment with what I'm doing. Well, that it's so surprising to me. I would never, ever think in a minute that you had any kind of nerves because you are so comfortable when you're out there performing. (laughs) I'm glad it comes off like that. (laughs) So, um, well, before we go to the break here, let's, uh, talk about the quirky turkey since it's about to be Thanksgiving. And I know that it's hard for podcast listeners to imagine, but like if we were to do that quirky turkey, (laughs) you are losing it already. (laughs) Like exactly how does it go? You have to... What you have to do is really embody the bird, be the bird. So you want to bend your elbows, flap your wings, loosen your shoulders, bob your head and neck, and then maybe put your hands behind your back, shake your tail feather. Just get real quirky with it, Nancy. (laughs) I am doing it. I'm doing the turkey in a chair move, actually. You're the quirkiest turkey I've ever met, Nancy. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> of course, I'm thinking of a turkey in a pan being basted before I go in the oven. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to play the quirky turkey music as we go out. And like, this is one of your songs that you've written. You, you've you written the music. Yep. And then you perform it. Yep. Um, and there's a story that goes with it, too. So what's cool about that is like, OK, you one piece of content. I wrote a story about a quirky turkey and then wrote a song for the episode. Then I created some videos for it. And then I did a quirky turkey challenge where other kids out there, they dance the quirky turkey. So it's cool that you can take like one piece of content and, you know, repurpose it in a lot of different ways. That's what it's all about mm-hmm. with content marketing. So yeah, repurposing your content. Mm-hmm. I love that. It's awesome. Flap your wings two times and sway them side to side. Bob your head back and forth and strut your stuff with pride. <laughs> quirky turkey, quirky turkey, shake your tail, you better worky. <laughs> Well, (laughs) 
We're going to just take a quick break now. We'll be back with Angela shortly. But I first want to share some exciting news with you about how you can connect with me uh, about the podcast. We've created the PR Maven Nation listener line, and you can call 207-620-9075 to get in touch with me and ask me questions, share feedback or ideas for the podcast, including who you'd like to hear on the show as future guests. So I look forward to hearing from you. And actually, now that we're talking about Roger Lambert, I think I need to have Roger Lambert on here to do one of his moose calls (laughs) from Strong, Maine, up there in Franklin County. (laughs) But right now, we're going to take a quick break and be back with more in just a moment. This podcast is all about growing your network in order to strengthen your brand. In my 30 plus year marketing and PR career, I have seen many organizations waste their precious time and money on marketing because they're trying to obtain success without any strategy to achieve their goals. So many organizations and companies suffer from what I call the shiny object syndrome, trying every new fad that comes down the pike. That's why I created the Marshall Plan 15 years ago. We have done over 100 of these plans for clients, helping them to get out of their day-to-day routine to identify their goals, solidify their brand story, focus in on their ideal customer avatar, analyze their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and create a realistic budget and measurement dashboard. We create the Marshall Plan collaboratively with our clients over the course of three months. We have a 65-step process to create a highly customized, actionable plan. And it's not like we come in and say, we are the consultants from away and we know everything. Instead, we come in and say, let's sit down at the table with your leadership team and we'll bring our expertise in what's working in PR and marketing. And our client team brings their knowledge of what's working in their organization. And together, we come up with a really amazing plan. For many, it's been a transformative process. I have watched how teams have come together and their faces light up because they have such a sense of accomplishment and they're so excited about the future of their organization. We help our client figure out the best way to implement the plan, sometimes using people within their organization and sometimes with our help. We would love to chat with you about how you can expand your network and achieve your marketing goals with a Marshall Plan. Go to marshallpr.com slash Marshall Plan to learn more about the process, or better yet, send me an email at nancy at prmaven.com, and we'll set up a time to talk and get started. And now back to our conversation. So welcome back. And now it's time for our book and things to do pad giveaway and to win a copy of my book, PR Works, and one of our coveted PR Maven Nation things to do pads. And Angela, yeah, I think you might have one, but you might be getting another one in the mail after being a guest. Lucky. (laughs) Yeah, I know. And you can then actually, a lot of people who are a little bit obsessive compulsive they write stuff down even after they've done it just so they can have the pleasure of checking it mm, off yes <laughs> i don't know if you're like that but i know i, I can start being like that <laughs> that sounds very gratifying <laughs> it is the, putting that check in that box is really rewarding i'm, I'm like, a cross through too oh yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you could only see her face She's like gritting her teeth, like, <laughs> got that one done. <laughs> so go to brmaven.com slash giveaway to enter today, and you could be our next winner. So welcome back. Today, we're talking with Angela Ferrari of Farmington, Maine. Well, she's Portland, Maine, but originally from Farmington. Mm-hmm. She's one of the famous Ferrari family. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot of alliteration. That's a lot of Fs. Yeah, actually, her her relatives own Ferrari Brothers, which is a famous store. Mm-hmm. I have a pretty funny story, actually, 
I just have to tell it now about Ferrari. <laughs> when I was married in 1987, um, my father, well, we got our, the tuxedos for the groomsmen and my father from Ferrari. From Ferrari Brothers? Yes. Oh, man. And, um, and my father went in there to get fitted for his tuxedo. And I think the store was busy that day. And so they said to him, are you a salesman? And he was in sales, like electrical equipment sales for Westinghouse. So he said, yes, I'm a salesman. And they said, okay, go stand in the corner. I think what they meant was like, are you here to sell us something? So therefore you're not a priority. <laughs> but he ended up like going and standing in the corner for quite a long time waiting to get fitted for his oh tuxedo my <laughs> because he was a salesman. Wow. Anyway, but I know that's your, those were your uncles, right? That's my grandpa and his two brothers, my great uncles, Norman uh, and David. Oh, okay. Yep. And so Marty... Marty took it over. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Yeah. See, again, these are all famous <laughs> Farmington fellows <laughs> to keep with that F theme. <laughs> okay. So anyway, getting back to our questions, I know that PR marketing and, and certainly social media have changed drastically over the course of my career. What techniques are you using now, Angela, that you didn't use when you started out? Well, when I started out in 2017, I, I was active since the beginning on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook with sharing my own posts. But what I've been able to do in the past couple in the past year is get braver when it comes to reaching out to bigger named people who have a, a bigger audience. So what I do is I will think about what are they working on right now and how can I promote their work and have them be a part of my show so we can cross pollinate? And an example of this is um, I really I really like cooking a lot. So I follow this noted um, American chef and food writer named J. Kenji Lopez Alt. And I noticed he was posting a lot of photos of cooking meals for his young daughter. And then he was also talking about a children's book that he had coming out. And I was like, oh, okay, great. I'm going to write a story about food and I want to pitch it to him and have him come on my show. And he did. And it was awesome. It was like, it was crazy to like be able to connect with him. And the fact that you can use social media to get access to people with really big followings who are really well known. So yeah, he got to come on my show, talk about his book and pitch that to a very relevant audience. So it was a win-win for both of us. So that's a technique that it's not just about putting your own stuff. It's finding ways you can connect and help other people on social media too. Again, that is just so awesome because what it's all about is being helpful and being of service. And you thought of a unique angle for that one person which I'm sure he appreciated too. That's what got his attention. So that's really a great technique of uh, PR and social media. Mm -hmm. Love that. Good work. We'll have to put a link to that one in the show yes, notes too. It's called Adventures of the Baby Foodie. Oh, yeah. Adventures of the Baby Foodie. <laughs> well, that's really great. Good job. So uh, how do you measure the success of your PR, social media, and marketing for Story Spectacular? Well, I mean, the numbers are important. I always want to see growth and sales and downloads and that sort of thing. But honestly, I've had my highest highs when I hear from little listeners. If I could get if I could measure success in kid art, that's like the metric I would go by because uh. I mean, I get some of the cutest illustrations or like there was one little girl that had a themed birthday party from one of my characters this year. Digger the dog. She had a Digger the dog party. Um, and then even just this week, I released an episode for Halloween called The Kooky Spooky Spider. And a little girl sent me a picture of a spider she made inspired by the story. Uh, so to me, like getting that kind of direct interaction is how I measure my success. When did you start falling in love with kids? I mean, have you always loved kids since you were a kid? I've, I, Nancy, I've never grown out of the pretend stage. I always am just, I'm very connected to my inner child and, um, I can relate to children on that level. Like I like their openness and their sense of wonder and their creativity. Like the ability to pretend is something I feel like a lot of people lose in adulthood, um, or they choose not to think about. 
And I, I love how kids are so present in that. So yeah, I, I've always been able to kind of connect with children. And now you make appearances at bookstores and libraries and even lighthouses, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. I've sold books that I have a, a children's book called Lawrence the Lighthouse that's based on the Portland Headlight in Casco Bay. And I've been selling that regularly at the at the Lighthouse gift shop and getting to meet people from all over. Yeah. And you said that even though a lot of the people who come into Portland on cruise ships will buy it, it's the locals who really resonate yeah, most with the book. Because I based all the boats on real boats in the harbor. So you'll see your ferry boat that you were just on of going to the islands. And it's it's home. You know, I fell in love with Portland when I moved here. It's a really special place. So it was really fun to get to showcase my home state in a story. Well, that's really great. Mm -hmm. Good job. Good job. Well, I'm glad you're doing those appearances. And again, we'll also put a link to Angela's uh, website on our site so you can follow along and go and meet her at one of her events. And I'm trying to get her connected with my cousin who's a children's librarian uh, in Augusta. So hopefully she'll be going to the Lithgow Library in Augusta, yeah. which is a really beautiful library. <laughs> So most successful people like you and me have a network of Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> most successful people have a network of fans and followers, either online or in person or both. How have you built your network of fans and followers? And has it been a conscious goal or has it happened on its own? Well, I think you talk a lot about this on your show. It's about mixing old media with new media. And I feel like you have to not just hit the pavement, but hit the keyboard. So I've tried to find ways where I can do both at the same time. So what I like to do if I do a live storytelling event, yeah, it's a lot of work and I'm not always in front of a huge audience, but I'll make sure I put my Instagram handle visibly on a big sign, some um, suggested hashtags. So parents at the live event are taking lots of pictures. I have these like cardboard cutouts and fun visual aids that make great photo opportunities. So they're sharing it on their social media. So I get to kind of reap the benefits of both at a live event. But the big thing when you meet people in person is you're creating a memory. You're getting so much more of a loyal fan, a loyal connection out of that. So that to me is worth its you know, not not all like fans are equal that you get a lot of flyby fans. If you have like, you know, one popular moment that goes viral, people can forget about it the next day. But having like something where you're meeting and you're creating a memory creates a more lasting um, long term connection. Well, in tourism marketing, which is something that my agency does a lot of, mm -hmm. we talk a lot about experiential marketing mm -hmm. and and, you know, even for the holiday season to give a gift of an experience. So give a gift card good for a foodie tour or mm -hmm. a brew bus tour or something like that. That is very, very popular right now. And I think it's because people like you have realized that, um, you know, having an experience or a shared experience is much more impactful than having a thing, mm -hmm. you know? And so, what you're doing is creating uh, the backdrop, you know, the the music and the story that people can share. And even you and I have had so much fun <laughs> dancing. And uh, I, I just love your videos. And, and I, I like to share them with any moms that I know, too, because I just... I wish my kids were little. My kids are in their 20s now, so I don't think they would do the quirky turkey no. dance with me anymore. Damn. I wish they would, though. <laughs> to talk to them about that. <laughs> but hopefully someday I'll have some grandchildren and then I can uh, then I can do the dances. And I told you how when I was growing up, my mom was a yes. preschool teacher. And, of course, she was big for, in the hokey pokey. And then this... The song Gray Squirrel, Gray Squirrel, Swish Your Bushy Tail. <laughs> you know, that was like she would always uh, do that with her preschool kids. But I do remember parties that my parents would host. And after she had had a few cocktails, she would sometimes <laughs> start doing the Gray Squirrel too. 
<laughs> I'll have to remind her that she's 86 years old now. I don't know if she recalls, but I think I'll remind her. <laughs> so, Angela, how has your network helped you to advance your career? Well, I, I completely rely on my network and my audience to do what I do. Um, and I learn a little something from everybody, even the people. I, you've recently talked about this on your show even the people that critique what you're doing, you can use that as an opportunity to, to improve and to they challenge you to do your job better. So I I need all of it to keep going, you know, otherwise I'm not going to be able to do what I do. And so, yes, I would say my network very much like allows me to do the work that means so much to me. Right. And your network is um, your core audience. Those mm -hmm. are the people that care the most about you. And as you, you referred to, um, I think when I talked about Jay Bayer's book, which is called Hug Your Haters. Yes, yeah. And how, you know, if somebody says something negative about you online, you should really embrace them. And a lot of times people like that really just want to be validated. And if, if you show that you care and that you're listening to them, they're, sometimes they're like children who are crying out for attention. Mm -hmm. So you thank them for the feedback. And of course, you don't want to carry on too long if they're like ranting or anything. Yeah. But try to take it offline. But yeah, sometimes they might be making a good point. So it's like pointing out your blind spots because praise isn't always that helpful. So sometimes like, oh, maybe if you do this, then yes, okay, this this is something that maybe people are too afraid to say. And if one person says it out loud, you can definitely take away something from it. Yeah, exactly. I just hope people, I hope nobody <laughs> sends me comments saying, would you please stop laughing? <laughs> that would really be hurtful. I shouldn't even say that out loud because maybe somebody else is going to do that now. But <laughs> of course, Tanner, my audio engineer at the Portland Pod would probably like it because when I laugh, he says that those, you know, those squirrely things that he has on his screen, they spike right up. Like, Oh my God, I don't think the sound system is made for my laugh. <laughs> it's the best laugh in podcasting, oh, Nancy. Thank you. That's why you're here as my guest today. <laughs> oh, thank you. So in your line of work, what is a resource such as a book, a website, or an app that you have found helpful and why? Um, I'm on YouTube every day looking up tutorials on how to do something because I'm completely self-taught. I, I never, you know, knew how to do any kind of sound engineering. I didn't know any of these programs on how to start a podcast. So I've spent hours and going on forums. Um, we're so lucky we live in a time where we have access to so much free information instantaneously. It's it's helped me, you know, every step of the way get through the the hurdles of technology. Yeah, well, it, it is really amazing mm -hmm. what's available on yeah. YouTube. And if you have any kind of a question, like how do I install a light bulb or whatever it is, yeah. other people have probably thought the same thing. Yep. So um, yeah, it's really a great resource. I, I don't know how we ever lived without the web. <laughs> It's hard to imagine. But back in the days of like rotary telephones and no web, yeah. you know, if we wanted to send a letter, we had to send it in the mail, which actually I still like doing. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so what is your one piece of advice for someone starting out in their career? Um, the big thing I would say is no one is going to give this to you. You have to put in the work. And I mean, capital W work, because that's what it takes and you can have all the talent in the world. Like there are far better writers, illustrators, sound engineers than me. But I think what makes the difference is that I show up and put the time in and that's going to make you an outlier. Anybody can do it. It's it's just all about putting the work and holding yourself accountable. I couldn't agree more. And you, you referred to an outlier. I mean, is that, are mm -hmm. you referring to Malcolm yes, Gladwell? Yes, yes. I'm so. obsessed with Malcolm Gladwell. Good yes. for you. Yep. And also, yeah, I mean, I think of the word persistence. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have been persisting in my career for, well, over 30, I have a hard time saying it, 35 <laughs> years now. And it doesn't get easy because... I just, every day I heap more pressure on myself to just keep at it and mm -hmm. keep showing up. And um, I think if you just try to like 
rest or, well, I mean, I guess I should rest a little more, but if, if you take your foot off the gas, uh, somebody's going to pass you mm-hmm. <laughs> on the highway of career success. So yeah, sticking with it is really important. So Angela, is there one parting thought you'd like to share with PR Maven Nation today? Um, yeah, my motto is create, create, create. So I I feel like everybody has a form of music in them. And I think it's so important. I challenge your listeners to find a way to get it out into the world. Yeah. Well, um, I think it's wonderful that you're so creative. And I think music is just a common language Mm -hmm. for people all over the world. And I'm sure you've had fans and followers from around the world who love your music. And and, uh, it just, it also is a great thing for adults to do with their children too, right? Is Mm -hmm. to to just play and dance. I mean, so. you still remember that song that your mom sang. I think everybody's got somebody who sang to them or told them stories. Or, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, my mother always loved to sing. And um, every morning she would come in my room to wake me up for school and she would sing, good morning, Mary Sunshine, how do you do today? I dreamt of you in sleep last night. Now please come out to play. <laughs> and, you know, my mom sang that to me every single morning. That's how I woke up. I didn't have an alarm clock or anything. So. That explains a lot about you, Nancy. <laughs> Mary Sunshine, yeah. <laughs> So, Angela, if people want to connect with you um, from PR Maven Nation, what's the best way for them to connect with you? Um, yeah, you can start with my website, a one-stop shop, storyspectacular.com. You can learn more about the books, the podcast, and all my contact infos on there. If you prefer to do email, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all of that info's there. And um, yeah, please reach out. I love hearing from people. I love talking kid lit podcasting. So um, yeah, I'm definitely anxious to hear from people. Oh, good. Well, this has been so much fun. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much. And I can't wait to release this episode and and have everybody doing the quirky turkey. I think I'm going to have people like submit videos to the Facebook page, PR Maven Nation of themselves doing the quirky (laughs) turkey. (laughs) Okay, PR Maven Nation. So uh, the chat Challenges out there to watch the quirky turkey and for Thanksgiving time, submit your own video. Have a great day, PR Maven Nation. That's it for this week's episode. I'd like to thank you for listening. And if you feel that you've gotten value out of today's conversation, consider leaving a five star review on iTunes or whatever app you're using to tune in. If you haven't subscribed yet, you should do so. I release a new episode each week and subscribing will make sure you get an alert when there's a new episode. You can also join the PR Maven Nation by going to prmaven.com slash nation and clicking join. It's free and it's a great community of like-minded individuals who are all looking to learn and grow from one another. If you have an Alexa-enabled device, be sure to add the PR Maven Marketing Minute to your daily flash briefing menu. Thanks again for listening and have a great rest of your week, PR Maven Nation.